Islam, in other words, gives reform. But wait, what does new mean for the current context of Islamic learning and thought? What should it mean? Is it simply accommodating Islam to suit and fit whatever that is already there? Is it repackaging Islam to appear trendy, fashionable and friendly to others? Or is it simply saying that whatever is Western is also Islamic? Or, is there more to it? Could it be the case that a closer look at what Islam is about suggests that the newness Muslims ought to seek transcends the mere accommodation to the present? That what is sought after is a transformation, a revolution of values, a horizon of good greater and beyond what we know in the present? That what we seek is not merely accommodation, but a new way of thinking, inquiring, looking into, and appreciating faith for a new and complex time. Comrades and friends, it is to explore these questions, this notion of reform, that we are all gathered here today. For we are with the Muslim thinker at the forefront of the discourse on Islamic reform, Brother Tariq Ramadan. Before we proceed to Brother Tariq, we shall first hear some opening thoughts from two key representatives of the organizers uh, of today's events. Please first welcome the director of the Islamic Renaissance Fund, Dr. Farouk Musa, to give his opening remarks. As the rationalists believed that one of God's crucial attributes is justice, hence man must have free will. Man must utilize his God-given faculty of reason to decipher between right and wrong and to establish justice. And since God is absolutely just, He would not reward or punish His creatures without reason. Human will receive reward in heaven or punishment in hell as a result of their free choice. Anyone who believes in a just God has to accept that man is the creator of his deeds. The rationalism of the Mutazilites led them to conclude that God and thus his universe operated according to rational laws, a premise that called on scientific inquiry. And from this emerged the scientific boom of the medieval Islamic world. The Zarif was the establishment of Baitul Hikmah, or House of Wisdom. Another important theoretical basis for the Mutazilites was that the Quran was created, which led to the imperative con con conclusion that the Quran can be interpreted and not merely implemented or applied. This literal translation of the Quran is mainly the basis for the current predominant literalist or Salafist trend in the Muslim world. Because of this literalist trend, many Muslims are trapped in the Benignan state concept of what was mentioned by the esteemed our Professor Torek Ramavan in his book Radical Reform, Obsession with Models Rather than with Principles. Basically, Muslims require to think and we think about this important agenda to exercise God-given rational faculty in order to face the challenges of modernity and this forms the basis of reform that we aspire to. We shall now hear from Khalid Jaffa, Director of Institute Kajian Dasa, or the Institute of Policy Studies, to share his thoughts uh, with us today. We are familiar with the great epoch of Islamic reform movement initiated by Jamaluddin al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdul in the late 19th century. Their ideas will continue to inspire 
any reform-minded Muslim today. Be that as it may, a century has elapsed since their time, and some of us felt that their ideas, shocking as they were for their time, are rather timid in the face of current realities. This is understandable. They were working their ideas when the Ottoman Empire, the last great Muslim empire, was at its terminal end. Abdul did not live long enough to see the First World War. He was spared of the shock of the last Muslim empire defeat in the Great War and the trauma of its dismemberment through the connivance of the British. Some empire. of the burning issues confronting the first generation of Islamic reformers are no longer with us, but some are still unresolved. The construction of a viable and prosperous political community under a nation state is a still ongoing project. Democracy did not feature at all in the thought of Afghani and Abdul. Abdul even harbored the notion of enlightened despotism as a political system for the Ummah. But the struggle for democracy, not just election, but free and fair election, a democracy that is inclusive and cosmopolitan, will be a great theme of the Muslim Ummah in the 21st century. Not too long ago, if our memory is not too short, not a few leaders of the Muslim country were fighting against the ideas of human rights, arguing that the ideas are culturally bound and have no universal application. Fortunately for this country, the Islamic activists who learned the art of Islamic movement from Hassan al-Banna are no less passionate in their advocacy of human rights than their secular-minded partners. Although the idea of feminism are already there among the disciples of Muhammad Abdul, notably Qasim Amin, the feminist movement in most Muslim society are more often than not scoffed off and their activists are waging a heroic battle to gain legitimacy. It is their great project of enlightenment, the assertion of the primacy of the intellect and the harmony of reason and the, the revelation that is one of the least successful aspects of the early Islamic reform movement and least appreciated. Scripturalism has almost banished reason into exile. Here, our speaker today is of great relevance and endowed with great courage. Quite often, the rhetoric of the Islamic movement conjures to us that the Muslim society are waging a perpetual war, political and cultural, with the West. Tariq Ramadan has called himself a Western Muslim, not only in a geographical sense, but also in a cultural and intellectual sense. Muhammad <laughs> ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you, thank you so much for this invitation here in Malaysia through the Islamic Renaissance Front and the, the Institute for Policy Research. It's I'm very grateful for you to organize this. Uh, uh, afternoon uh, thinking or rethinking the concept of reform and, and the dimension of reform. Uh, it's an important topic for many reasons and I think that the two first uh, uh, presentation and papers were quite clear about some of the questions that we are, in fact the three because your introduction as well was setting some of them that are uh, important in, in the discussion. Uh, and I think from, from all the, the questions that we, we have these days and the challenges that we are facing, it's quite important to come to a clear understanding of what we are talking about. Wherever you go these days in Muslim majority countries, you listen to what is happening in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Syria, in uh, Yemen, in Turkey, of course, and, and other countries even here in Malaysia people who are talking about, sorry, reform, talking about moderation, talking, talking about al-wasatiyya, which is the middle path. Everywhere we have words, we have apparently vision. I'm not sure that we are talking about the same thing. I'm not sure that we are agreeing even on definitions. So at least the starting point of uh, 
uh, an intellectual uh, commitment to to move to go ahead with uh, a clear understanding of our tradition and and the Islamic principles should uh, start with a discussion and the concept a clear framework that we may not agree on some of the elements but at least we are clarifying the picture clar clarifying the the references and it's also important uh, in Muslim, in uh, in the west in uh, in uh, the united states of america canada europe uh, australia where we have also communities and, and muslim presence and we also are talking about the same concept but very often there is a gap between the two realities we don't really share our experiences or if we do it's very often superficially and things that are quite interesting is for the first time in history it's now uh, what we are experiencing in the West that it's coming back to Muslim majority countries as to some of the priorities that we are facing in the contemporary world which was not the case for uh, centuries and, and during the last century with the new Muslim presence in the West. So the concept of reform is everywhere, its definitions nowhere really. Uh, its understanding gets not clear, the, the objectives are not defined very often and we might, and this was my own experience, I have been trained by Muslim scholars and I got, you know, an ijazat, the permission to teach from scholars that were all, in fact, coming from the reformist trend. And I realized after 20 years that we were using the same word, not with the same meaning. So it took a time. It took me some time to come to the understanding that it might be that the problem was in the objectives, what we are expecting and what we understand and how we are understanding things. And it comes also from, it's not only a question of definition, it's very much also a double question of understanding what Islam is and should be as a religious tradition but also something which has to do with a psychological attitude. The way you look at others, the way you face the West, as it was mentioned here, the way you face the contemporary sciences, and the way you think of your tradition facing the contemporary sciences. And the psychological factor is very important. It's not because you are repeating that you are reforming and changing and moving that you are doing so. Sometimes it's just a way for you to face a threat and, or an, uh, uh, an appeared threat or a perceived threat, which might not be a threat but could be challenging. And we have this. The challenge of diversity in Islam, it's not a challenge of a threat that is coming to you to uh, undermine your foundations. But it might be the way God wanted the world to be to help you to think about yourself and to become better. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَلَكِنْ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فِي مَا آتَاكُمْ فَاسْتَبِكُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ If God had willed, He would have made you one community. But in fact, is to see and to assess the way you act and behave, so compete in good deeds. The challenge of diversity could be war. The challenge of diversity could be positive competition. So when you look at what the people are producing and others are producing, it might be a threat if you only are concerned with power but it could be a contribution from the other if you are concerned with well-being and contributing to the well-being of humanity. It's a psychological attitude, is the way you look at what is coming from the other. And unfortunately, very often the Muslims are putting themselves in a competition of power, not a competition of good deeds. So who is leading? But leading towards what? In 
with the, the intention of achieving what? These are the main questions that we have to ask. This is the starting point for me of saying that it's not only a question of intellectual debates, it's also to ask ourselves how do we look at the world and how do we understand our presence and our mission in the world. Now, uh, as an introduction, three points uh, added to the first part of my introduction, which was already a bit long. The first point is that the concept of reform, in the way it's, uh, it should be understood, and also coming from our tradition as Muslims, but also the other tradition, remember that even if you think about the concept of reform in the Christian tradition, what Luther or Calvin was saying to the Catholic Church was, be careful, you should take the text seriously. Instead of focusing on your church and the structure of power within church, let us come back to the text. They were protesting against an interpretation to come back to the text. And when I talk about reform from within the Islamic tradition, and if you look at all the reformers, all the mujaddidun, the people who were renewing our understanding, were coming with something which is essential. Come back to the texts before struggling with power and people. So the way I look at reform from an Islamic viewpoint is a very serious position here, is I want to take the texts seriously. I'm not, I don't want to play with texts. The Quran is the Quran and the prophetic traditions are the prophetic traditions. The Quran and Sunnah, what is said in the Quran, al kitab wal hikmah meaning the, the, the Quran and the prophetic traditions Al-Hikmah is the word which is used also in the Quran to speak about the prophetic tradition this is the principle these are the principles and these are the references so when I'm talking about reform it's not to come with an intellectual revolution with no basis, with no principles, with no foundations because my take on what we are witnessing today in our experiences today is we are very far from the letter and the spirit of the text and very, very close to new kind of institutions or institutionalized power or centers of power that are problematic. Or even absence of thinking by repeating. And the problem is that some of the Mujaddidun were telling us the problem with the Muslim thought is al jumud al jumud wa taqlid The taqlid was to repeat, al jumud was to stop thinking because we are repeating what was said in the past. The problem is that we have today Mujaddidun who are people advocating reform who end up to repeat what was said by the Mujaddidun of the past. So I call them Muqallidun Mujaddidin. So the imitators of the reformists who are having with reformists the same attitude as the, the imitators have with the old tradition. And we repeat the thoughts and we say, yes, we are reforming, but in fact we are repeating the same things without being creative. The concept of reform is be serious with the text and creative with your mind. And the only way to be serious with the text when time passes and uh, cultures change is to be creative with your mind. You are betraying the very essence of the text if you stop thinking and only repeat the text or imitate what was done by people. They did what they did in the light of the context and the text. The text which is eternal, but the context which is historical. Now it's your turn. Find the right way to deal with your context in the light of the eternal text. So the first point for me is not to come here and to undermine, because what I see with some people who are calling themselves reformers is for them the first attitude is to, to deal with the text with, in a way which is not serious. 
It's as if the text, you don't study, you don't have a, a, an understanding of the text. You take one verse and you can build on the verse without knowing the context. It's, it's science. You know, it's knowledge. The text needs to be studied and know the chronology, the differences as Bab in Musul, the, the, the causes and the reasons of revelation, what was said where and how, how it was understood, why. It's, it's study. It's not just you quote and you understand. So I, I really want you to understand, I'm not coming here by uh, uh, spreading around, you know, a radical reform which is radically against the text, but radically with the text against, you know, Jumud, which is stop thinking. The second point is that many uh, 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 brothers and sisters and Muslims from within the tradition when I speak in English and when I use the concept of reform, they say, no, reform is not us. Reform is coming from Christianity. And this is what I call the double alienation of the contemporary Muslim mind. It's not the only to be alienated, and alienated is, in the normative sense, alienated is to think about yourself through the eyes of the other. But the problem is the double alienation is you think about yourself through the eyes of the other because you are ignorant of yourself. So it's not only because you have an inferiority complex towards the other civilization, so to speak, but it's also you are so ignorant of your own tradition that you end up thinking that what you think is coming from the other while in fact is coming from yourself but you are ignorant of yourself. So, so many philosophers, and, and Western philosophers were even saying that the concept of reform reached the West through the Islamic presence in Europe. But we don't know this. We keep on repeating it's coming from them because we don't know history. One of the international intellectual disease in all our societies today in Malaysia as well as in the United States of America or the European countries is we are neglecting history. We don't read. We don't come back to the roots. And then we start thinking again because we don't know that people before us thought about the same things or contributed to the field. The concept of reform, if we come back to the Islamic tradition, is rooted in the Islamic tradition through two words that we find in the Quran and the, the prophetic tradition, is al-islah wa tajdeed. Al-islah, in fact, literally means to come back to a sound state, which in English is reform, to form again to the sound state of the beginning, which is islah. And you have two words that are, two ways of dealing with islah, is islah, is, is to reform our thinking and to reform our societies. And in fact, we need to reform our thinking in order to reform our societies. So this is the concept of Islam, and it's very quick when you read the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, you, you find people saying, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ مُسْلِحُونَ meaning we are here to reform the society for the better. And in fact, the way they are neglecting the truth make them mufsidun. They are spreading uh, corruption around the world. So you have the word meaning that this is where we have to understand. And uh, this is where uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the hadith, is talking about which is people who are coming and they are going to reform my sharia and my sharia is not only islamic law is bigger than this is wider than this is the islamic path is the path towards faithfulness from which law are only one dimension because Sharia has to do with our heart, has to do with spirituality, has to do with the way we are faithful to a message, not only through law, but through the spiritual meaning of life. It has to do with a way of life and death, not only a way of life, but death. Because it's very important, the way you live is also a dimension of the way you consider death. And if you try to avoid death in your thinking, you will have a specific way of life. But if, you remember what the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma dhakkirna bil mawti kulli sa'a. It's something which is deeper than that. Oh God, remind us with our own death every hour. 
This is what he was asking why. Because the more we know that it's going to end, the more we come back to the one who has no end. The eternal being. So this sense of fragility, this spiritual dimension, this is also part of Sharia. Sharia is not right, wrong, halal, haram. This is one dimension. You need the vision, the vision, the, the concept of life, which is much more important, not more important, in fact, which is essential before coming to the law. It's not more important. Law are important. The, the, the laws and, and legislation uh, are important. But the, what is behind the philosophy that is bearing this legislation, it's important in the way we deal with, with it. So having said that now, and understanding what I, I, I want to say about uh, uh, the, the words, so we have Islah, the second word is Tajdeed, and we have another Hadith. Uh, so what I was saying about Sharia is, uh, the Prophet is saying that people are going to come to reform my Sharia after other people are going to corrupt my Sharia. So it's possible to corrupt the understanding, to corrupt the implementation. So we need to reform. This is the Prophet So it's not, it's not something which is coming from the West. It's rooted in our tradition. And the Prophet ﷺ saying at the same time, "Inna Allah yabathu li hadi al-umma ala ra'si kulla mi'atin sana may yujaddu la hadi naha." Meaning by this that God is going to send one person or a group of people who are coming every 100 years to help this community to renew its religion. And all the scholars understood, and this is in fact bil ijma consensus. It means we are not going to change the Quran, we are not going to change the Ahadith, we are going to change the Muslim minds. So, this is the, the difference between what was said and what I keep on repeating. I am not advocating reforming Islam, I am advocating reforming the Muslim minds.